All right. Uh, ETM Hotep, want to welcome everyone to our live uh, Divine Words Wednesday uh, hangout. And you're hanging with the Seshu Ma'ani Meta Nature. And my name is Wujao Mineb Eri Ma'at. And tonight we have uh, other members of the Seshu Ma'ani Meta Nature on the panel. So if you all can uh, unmute yourselves and uh, introduce yourselves, let everyone know who's with us tonight. Hotel. Hotel. Well, welcome in peace. This is June. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the show. Hotel. ETM Hotel, Send Judy. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, hopefully, everybody learned something and takes something away from the show tonight. Peace. Hotep, um, Reni, Tonika, my name is Tonika, and I'd like to welcome you all to our Divine Words Wednesday. Welcome. Hotep, this is Sin Sean. Just want to welcome everyone to the show. Hopefully, everyone will enjoy, and you have a good day. ETM Hotep. Dua Dua U, Day in Uncle Jao Zeneb, Hekanu in Amin Ra Pata Kwa E Sekum, Ren E, Kofi Paisai. On behalf of the Seshu, uh, we just want to um, thank you all for tuning in to the show. And we would all just like to welcome, welcome, welcome you all. All right. And I'm sure other the other brothers um, will be joining us as well. All right, um, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get into our topic for tonight. And if just one of you all can let me know when it can be seen. Yes, we can see from you. All right. All right. Actually, okay. All right, so we can jump right on in. Um, so again, uh, welcome to our Divine Words Wednesdays, and we are the Seshu Ma'ani Meta Nature, and obviously you are watching us on our YouTube channel. But if you haven't subscribed as of yet, please subscribe so you'll be uh, kept up to speed and uh, get notified when we have our online uh, sessions. Um, now we have a, a few series of videos that we do or sessions and hangouts that we do. Uh, tonight is our Divine Words Wednesdays, but we also have Freestyle Fridays where we um, get online and, and we have fun, uh, especially a, a fun study session where we, um, eliminate the use of the books in terms of um, dictionaries and things. And we pick a inscription or one is recommended to us by uh, anyone in our Facebook group uh, that we, you know, attempt to transliterate and translate on the fly, basically from memory. And that way it'll test our um, proficiency in, in the language. You know, how much do we remember? remember? Do we, can we identify all of the glyphs individually? Can we identify words? Do we know what their meanings are? You know, so that's a good exercise we recommend everyone do. And we, and we also uh, encourage crowd participation. All right, so audience participation through the chat. You know, it's kind of limited on YouTube, but we do our best. And then we also have a third series called Welcome to the Sabayat Dome, where uh, those are hangouts where we take controversial issues in the, in the, um, social community as it relates to Kemet or the language, and then we address it. So we, we try to um, find out and discern the accuracy of, of various different claims. All right. And that particular series is, um, you know, as, as these ideas or as these claims come up, so we don't have a particular day uh, or consistent time for that series. All right. So that's what we have going on so far. I'm going to add some more 
uh, not, some more series of hangouts and shows as we go along. All right. And um, please join our Facebook group, Seshu Ma'ani Metal Nature on, on Facebook, where we have uh, discussions. You know, people share their research, people ask questions. Um, you know, if we make any errors on these hangouts or on even other posts and throughout Facebook or social media, you know, that's the place to come and discuss it, bring it up. Because our um, our goal is is for, you know, correct information, accuracy. All right. And we're all learning. So we're all susceptible to make mistakes or have errors. So we uh, definitely invite and encourage people to, um, you know, correct us if uh, if we should make any mistakes. Now, before we actually jump into our topic, we always like to start off with a recitation of the offering formula. So I will pass the mic over to uh, Sonet Tonica. All right, um, Dua. So um, I'll go ahead and um, do uh, or recite the, the offering formula. And uh, if you're looking at it uh, on your screen, well, we have uh, these three sections on the top. Um, that is what is known as um, the sesh metronetra or hieroglyphs or hieroglyphics. And um, the part that is in the middle, that's the formula uh, transliterated. And um, the bottom part, that's the translation, which is um, in English, obviously. And um, uh, I'm going to recite it and the pronunciation would like to just make a disclaimer that it is um, what is known as Egyptology speak is uh, tentative, is not accurate. Uh, and yeah, so without further ado, let me just go ahead and recite. Oh yeah, and um, while I do that, uh, if you're watching, you can also recite along with me. And um, uh, I'm going to uh, recite it in the name of the ancestors, which is known as Aku. But you can insert any name that you want to um, of anybody that you feel that has passed along that you'd like to include in the offering formula. So, um, so I'll just go ahead and, and do that right now. Hotep de Nesu, Wesir Neb Jadu, Necha'a Neb Abju, D.F. Beret Kheru, T. Henket Ka Aped Shes Menchet, Chet Nebet Neferet Wabet Anket Necha'im, In Kani Imahu Aku Mahiru. And the translation is an offering the king gives Osiris. Lord of Jadu, great God, Lord of Abydos, so that he may give verbal offerings in beer, bread, ox, fowl, alabaster, and linen, everything good and pure on which a God lives, for the car of the revered ones, the ancestors, justified. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and pass the microphone back to Jao. All right, uh, Dua and Iker, as always, um, and just so people will know, we, we've adopted that, uh, practice of, of going over the recitation, um, before we jump into our discussions and things from, uh, Dr. Rakete Amin, who has, um, the one who's actually does that. And it's a very good way of starting off any kind of, um, cipher bill session, uh, discussion class and things like that. Cause it kind of sets the tone, you know, we, we all always want to, invoke the ancestors or have a sense of um uh reverence to to the ancestors and things and uh giving offering formula which may be uh, a topic for a whole hangout you know we can talk about the offering formula itself and how prolific it was throughout all of kemet and basically what it means and what it was used for you know so maybe we can do a hangout for that but it's also a good way to start off any gathering, similar to the libation ritual that you'll see a lot of uh, people um, perform as well. All right. So tonight's topic is uh, will be a brief topic, and the topic is primary sources and attestation. All right. And um, this subject comes up because there, although you know, primary sources and attestation may seem very straightforward and very simple because you can simply look up in a dictionary or, you know, find out what these are. 
which is what I'm going to read the uh, definitions. But a lot of people um, will either uh, neglect to use these terms properly or the ideas or concepts that they represent improperly. Okay, so um, and we see that quite a bit on uh, social media, on Facebook, when you know, in discussing history, especially you know, on the subject of history. You know, a lot of times, especially when we talk about ancient history, ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet, Kush, Nubia, um, and uh, the many different African um, cultures, or just cultures. Period in history, you know, a lot of times people will use these terms, primary sources. So. We're just gonna have a quick discussion about that, all right, and and point out the differences. So, source classification. Uh, many sources can be considered either primary or secondary, depending on the context in which they are used. The distinction between primary and secondary sources is contextual, making it somewhat difficult to distinguish. A third level, the tertiary source such as an encyclopedia or dictionary, resembles a secondary source in that it contains analysis, but attempts to provide a broad introductory overview of a topic. So you, we have primary, secondary, secondary, and tertiary sources, all right? So what is a primary source? Now, if you notice that um, the distinctions between primary and secondary sources is contextual, so it's so it's pretty much relative, all right. So it's not a one fit, uh, one definition fits all type of situation, and I think that's what causes some of the confusion that we see on social media. So hopefully we can discuss a little bit and straighten that out. So what is a primary source? The definition of a primary source varies depending on upon the academic discipline and the context in which it's used. So in humanities. Um, a primary source could be defined as something that was created either during, during the time period being studied or afterwards by individuals reflecting on their involvement in the events of that time. And so in the social sciences, the definition of primary source would be expanded to include numerical data that has been gathered to analyze relationships between people, events, and their environment. And in the natural sciences, a primary source could be defined as a report of original findings or ideas. These resources often appear in the form of research articles with sections on methods and results. Now on this last one, in natural sciences, this is, this is where you get the term original research. You know, I, um, a lot of people on social media use that phrase original research and, um, and there's some people that will use that phrase improperly. Uh, but we we could probably get into that as well. Now, in terms of a lot of the the discussions that we see on social media, uh, as it relates to history, ancient Egypt, ancient Africa, period, will fall under humanities, you know, anthropology, and you know, or history. So this this first bullet will be. Um, the, the primary one invoked when we use this term primary source. All right. So let's go to what is a secondary source. So secondary sources are less easily defined than primary sources. Generally, they are accounts written after the fact with the benefit of hindsight. They are interpretations and evaluations of primary sources. So here's some examples of secondary sources. So when you see bibliographies, uh, and sometimes bibli bibliographies can be called tertiary because it depends on the, the academic discipline you're speaking of and the uh, context. Yeah, biographical works are considered secondary, commentaries, criticisms, dictionaries, encyclopedias, and these can be also considered tertiary. You have histories. Literary criticism, such as journal articles, uh, magazines, newspaper articles, monographs, textbooks, websites, etc. Okay, so these are secondary sources. Uh, the third, what is a tertiary source? Tertiary sources consist of information which is a distillation and collection of primary and secondary sources. So basically, it's like a, a source gathering 
source, if you will. So we have almanacs, bibliographies, uh, chronologies, dictionaries, encyclopedias, uh, directories, fact books, guidebooks, etc. All right, and textbooks as well, and they can also be considered secondary. All right. So, uh, attestation. Now, this word is is uh, confused a bit um, as well on um, social media discussions. And so the definition of that is in the context of history, because we're talking about history mainly, uh, attestation deals with a form of evidence. So it is a thing that serves to bear witness, confirm, or authenticate for which the evidence has survived to, this, to the present day. So like, for example, if, um, if you say something is attested, then it exists today. It, you, you can actually bear witness to it today. So if something way back in history in ancient times and it's attested, then it still survives to this day. Okay, that's what an attestation is or uh, something that is, that is attested. All right. Now, one of the questions comes up uh, or comes up quite frequently is, when we're talking about primary sources, so let's go backwards first. Let me, let me go back to the primary source. But remember, the main one that we're invoking in, in the context of a lot of discussions on, on social media is in, in the context of history. So a primary source could be defined as something that was created during the time period being studied or afterwards by the individuals reflecting on their involvement in the events of the time. So basically, a primary source is something that's direct, you know. So if you're studying, let's say, the 18th dynasty of Kemet, uh, that time period, then a primary source would be something that was actually created in that time period or something that was done by people in that time period, et cetera. Okay, objects, artifacts, and things that were uh, created during that time period. Okay, so um, and and now, so this is what I'm gonna bring up to uh, this slide here: primary sources in reproduction, because there's a little bit of confusion. People will separate uh, an artifact from the fact that the artifact is being, um, I guess, uh, made public by a third party. And they will tend to kind of disconnect that from being a primary source, and that would be that would be an error. So, for example, if I show you a stila from the 18th dynasty, let's just say, and um, it's stored in the British Museum, and you go to the British Museum and you're looking at the object, just because it's you're standing in the British Museum. And they have obvious, obvious uh, control over it and so on and so forth. That doesn't take away from the fact that it is an actual primary source. Okay, so uh, I'll read this slide. It says, for some levels of research, it is acceptable and appropriate to use primary sources that have been reproduced and published. A few examples include microfilmed newspaper articles, published diaries, and scanned images of original documents or facsimile published in book form. So this is important because like, for example, you have papyri, the various different papyri, and a lot of people will be familiar with the uh, so-called Book of the Dead, the Runu Perenim per Heru of various different uh, peoples. And the most famous one is described Ani. Uh, that particular papyrus is, with, is held in the British Museum and it's on display and it's and it's uh you know it's put inside of a um glass casing and i believe you know it's on display on the walls uh, at the museum now they also re have taken pictures of the papyrus and published it in books you have several different books publications of it um i think ea wallace budge is the most famous one that a lot of people will be familiar with um his publication of these facsimiles. Now, those are primary sources. It's just that they're reproduced in the form of an image 
um, so that it can be published and, and publicized, but it's still a primary uh, source. So this is important. So this is why uh, this is included on this slide. And there, there, you know, there's people that will confuse that and say, well, that's not a primary source. You know, um, I want to see, I want to see the actual um, papyrus. And we all know that if you go over to Egypt, you're not going to be walking into the museum, Cairo Museum, touching <laughs> these uh, objects yourself. You know, uh, go to the British Museum, they're not going to let you pull the uh, pa the papyrus um, off the wall, open up the casing, and then just, you know, turn it over and uh, feel it and everything like that. It's just not going to happen. So what a lot of people do, they'll take pictures of them themselves or they'll find the facsimiles of them to examine them. And but but the point is is that these are still primary sources, All right? And so here's just a few pictures of uh, primary sources. So here's a pyramid text of Winnes. A lot of people will um, say Unes. You can see his name inside of the um, Chinu, or most people will know as a cartouche. You see the um, hare, rabbit, water ripple, reed leaf, and a folded cloth spelling out the name Winnes. Uh, you actually see it all over the place. Uh, you see all these different uh, Chinu, quite a bit. But it's a pyramid text, it's of the fifth dynasty and approximately dated to 2400 to 2300 BC. All right, so this would be considered a primary source. Even as it is on the screen here, this, is, this will be a, a picture of the actual artifact, the actual object, because you're not going to take it home into your living room uh, to look at it because this is in uh, Egypt still to this very day. All right, but it's still considered a primary source. Here's another one uh, the famous stella of King Jet of the first dynasty, approximately dated to 2980 BCE. Okay, this is just um, the stela. And you can see the uh, falcon, Heru, for the word Heru. And you see the Sorek, which is a um, imitation of a palace facade. And then you see the cobra for the name within the Sorek. So this is Heru Jet, uh, King Jet of the First Dynasty. So this, is, this would be a primary source, all right? A reproduction of a primary source, not a reproduction of the actual artifact, but a reproduction in the form of an image, even as you see it on the screen here. Um, and here's an example of the papyri or papyrus, excuse me, of Ani that's in the British Museum. Okay, so you see how they have it enclosed. This is a smaller image of it, of, of one sheet, but they have it enclosed in um, a frame. Uh, with a backdrop, but this is the actual artifact itself. Okay, and you can examine it. We can, we can, um, in terms of this particular object, we can use it to transliterate, translate, because we're actually looking at the the actual artifact itself. Even though this is a picture of it, uh, we're not handling it with our own hands and everything, but it still would be considered a primary source. And I believe this is the last one, just to show uh, a last example. Uh, this is from the first intermediate period uh, around approximately Dynasty 11, uh, 20, 2030 BC. And this is housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And that's the accession number 2895. Um, and this particular object is a practice board for scribes and it, and it reads, um, it is clear from the awkwardly formed hieroglyphs and their uneven spacing that this is the work of an apprentice scribe who was practicing his penmanship. The writing board could be used again and again by scraping and wiping off the ink and adding a new coat of whitewash. All right, so this will be considered a primary source from this time period, even though it's housed in the museum and even though we're looking at a picture of it. All right, and I believe that is the last picture. Oh. This is the last picture. Um, now, this is a primary uh, document or a cropped picture of a primary document of the Papyrus Prissy of the 12th dynasty. 
And this is a famous um, papyrus because it, it contains the maxims of Patahotep that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, and this is a portion of it, uh, this top portion you see here. So here's a picture of the actual um, document. So this will be considered a primary source. Now under it would be is a transcription of this simplified hieroglyphic uh, script, you know, as we would call Seshmeter Netcher. So what you see is um, a simplified Seshmeter Netcher, and then you will see a more formal pictorial um, style of Seshmeter Netcher beneath it. And this right here would not be a primary source. Okay, so that's the that's the difference. This is the primary source, and this is a, a, a transcription of it. And um, Egyptologists tend to take this simplified Sesh Metanature and put it into a more formal pictorial version for, clar for clarity and for ease of reading for people who are studying it. Um, you know, but us, we of the Seshu, Mani Metanature, we um, encourage and prefer to deal directly with the primaries ourselves. So in order to do so, we would have to uh, learn um, this simplified version of the formal pictorial. So this is these are the exercises, these are things that we learn uh, as a group because of our preference. But just in case people don't wanna go to, to those lengths, then uh, Egyptologists will transcribe it. Okay, and and then you have to pretty much rely on the transcriber's um, competency and, and and accuracy, you know. But if you if you are able to read the simplified version of this writing system, then you don't have to rely on the uh, transcription, and that's just what we prefer. All right, but you know, not everyone uh, everyone has different levels of, of of rigor and study that they apply. All right, and I believe that is the last one. Yes. Um, so I, I, I want to kind of open it up. So I wanted to go over those definitions and, and, and these few examples, these, these real short examples, and then open up the discussion because I wanted to um, ask any of you all on the panel um, your experience on social media in terms of discussions about history and then, you know, primary sources and and whether people are misusing the terms or using them wrongly or or what have you. So maybe you all can share um, some examples or even you yourself, maybe, you know, because a lot of times we will, um, in our learning process, we may misuse terms uh, the wrong way at first. And then when we learn better, we do better. And I always say, when you know better, you do better. That's, that's the way it should be. Um, but before I open up the discussion, I want to, um, show or, or uh, put everyone on notice that come coming this January 2017, um, Sonet Tonica will be uh, teaching a penmanship course. So you'll be able to learn to write Seshmeto Netcher, all right, in a uh, simplified way that you see here on the screen, that you see over here on the right, on the right, right hand side. And we discussed last week the benefits of, of actually doing that and, and um, becoming a, a scribe, uh, if you will, and to put it into practice. There's a lot of benefits, and I would encourage you to go back to the archives and listen because um, it's nothing but benefits to that. So that's coming up in uh, January. And also, um, a new class group is forming. So if, if, if you know, if you, uh, know anyone who's interested in learning how to transliterate and translate or um, to get into the study of Egyptian hieroglyphic writing system that we know as Sesh Metro Nature, um, sign up, go to the website, uh, metanature.com is mdw-ntr.com. Uh, go there, sign up, or you can email or contact me on Facebook or contact any member of the Seshu and uh, let me know that you're interested because uh, we're forming a, a new class group the classes are for 12 weeks. They total 24 hours, but it's extended out for 12 weeks, two hours a week. All right. And we walk through a beginner's introduction to Metonetra. So 
uh, that course is designed to lay the f uh, solid foundation of all of the um, essentials, the basic information, the foundational information that you need to know and equip you with the tools and the knowledge on how to use those tools in order to transliterate and translate uh, basic Egyptian text. Okay, 12 weeks of your time um, or 24 hours of your time totally, but uh, 12 week uh, duration of time and you'll be set and good to go. And then from there, you can go to the next stage and learn the grammar. And then from there, you go to the next stage even after that and get into um, historical comparative linguistics if you so choose to, all right? So I just wanted to um, lay all that out. And now we can open it up for, um, for this discussion. I don't think I have to share any more slides again, so I'm gonna come out of this and um, yeah, if anybody uh, wants to begin a discussion, uh, go, go for it. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'll go ahead. No, I saw, I saw one. Oh. I saw someone's one's microphone off, so I thought it was going to speak. But um, yeah, I haven't had any um, direct. Um, speaking of um, the primary sources and whatnot, I, I haven't been involved in any kind of discussions directly uh, uh, regarding that. But I've, uh, I've I've seen a lot of those discussions going on where um, sometimes um, someone will be asked for um, you know a primary source, but um, you know, then you get um, the person and just including what you would probably um, call the secondary <laughs> sources where is um, uh, someone going into analysis about something. So it's a second hand opinion or something in that sense. So, uh, um, and, and that can, I, I see that it, get, it can get frustrating, you know, because um, there isn't, most people are not aware of what a primary source is and what, um, an analysis or what an, an interpretation of what you call the secondary source is. So I see that happening a lot. And, you know, I, I guess uh, I like to say it's good that we're going through this just so most people are aware of, of what it is. And and I would also like to um, add that I wasn't, you know, I've seen where people also discuss about the pictures. You know, if somebody takes a picture of a pyramid uh, in, in Kemet and that's like, okay, that's not a primary source, that's just a picture. But it, uh, from what we're learning, it is a primary source. Obviously, like you said, you can't, um, you know, you're not going to carry a whole pyramid and bring it, <laughs> you know, so that would be considered um, reproduction of a primary source in that sense. And it will work as, you know, primary source. Mm -hmm. and, and see now, th this is where, now see, we have to discuss the, the limitations of that as well, you know, so it's not always um, clear cut because we live in an age of Photoshop. So what can happen is people can take a picture um, either with their own cameras, they can go over to Egypt, take a picture of, let's say they walk into the um, temple of Seti the First in Abydos, and they may take a picture with their own camera, physically do it, but then when they get home, they, they're a Photoshop whiz, and then they start Photoshopping things on there, and then they publish a Photoshop version of their picture. So we do have to be careful. So it's not like a um, a clear, you know, cut and dry um, definition or thing about the reproduction of the primary sources. So you know, it's all within within reason. And we've seen people do that, not not intentionally. Uh, we've seen some competitions, um, some Photoshop competitions where people will take e Egyptian pictures and then, you know manipulate them and enter it into the competition. And I know one of the famous ones is, um, well, not so much Egyptian, but there's a famous, there was a famous competition done a few years ago where um, a, a group of guys submit or guys submitted pictures of giants and it was giant skeleton bones. And you can see uh, people excavating graves or digging, clearing out graves. And they're, they're trying to, you know, brush away the, the debris from these giant skeleton bones. But if you look at the real actual picture, the bones weren't giant at all, but it was, it was manipulated and, and it was entered into the uh, Photoshop comp competition. You have an instance where you see a mummy 
that's been photoshopped to make it look like an alien. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with that uh, recently. Um, and, you know, a lot of things. So we do have to be careful of pictures, you know, so I don't want to give the impression that, hey, a uh, picture, you know, don't worry about it. The picture is all good. Uh, no. But, uh, you know, we just got to have to be careful with that. So you have pictures. Oh, you were going to say something? Yes, I was going to say, um, obviously, that, um, you know, with any kind of sources that uh, you that, you know, somebody is like um, researching on, you know, they, you have to kind of like put your, you know, you use your head, use your, you know, uh, you know, analyze everything and make sure that, you know, it is legit. And this is where, um, you know, discernment, you know, come come into place. So it could be a, it just like um, even just reading, even if it's a secondary uh, source, if you're reading, um, reading something or looking through books and all of that. So I think um, that would also help, you know, just trying to figure out what is legit, what is not, because uh, in a lot of things also get written. You know, people write a lot of things. So um, all of that will also kind of like um, critical analysis will also come into place when you're, uh, you know, so sourcing anything, whether it's primary sources or secondary or tertiary. You know? Yeah. And that's good. I see um, uh, Monica has a question. Uh, are the source you all will be using comes from a picture you took in Africa. Um, I'm not sure what that's being referenced to specifically, but but on along those lines, um, the brother Antoine, um, I don't think Antoine is with us right now as of yet. Oh, yeah, he's here. Uh, yeah, hotel, hotel family. I do got a question when we get done. Okay, yeah, Mark. a.k.a. Hush your mouth. Uh, Brother Antoine, recent trip to um, Kemet or modern day Egypt, um, he was able to take a lot of pictures. You know, when he came back, he shared it with us. We have a, we have that in the archives, of our video archives as well. But that would be preferred as well. You know, if you can actually go take pictures yourself instead of relying on it because of this, um, you know, digital era where people can can. Um, can manipulate photos and things. But we have to remember that that it's all, you know, science is about eliminating error. You know, you want to eliminate error. That's 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 what you're moving towards, eliminate the elimination of error. And that's the even that's the reason why we're even talking about source classification in the first place. Because the question is why primary sources and not secondary or tertiary sources or which one is better out of the three? And then obviously the answer would be primary sources. And the reason why is because it stands the, um, the it has a less potential of having error. And that's what science is about. You know, in order to make history more scientific, you want to deal with primary sources, you know, the actual objects, the actual people, you know, um, similar to, to any uh, thing. Like let's say an event takes place. Let's say, um, Something happens at, let's say, a bank was robbed. You know, when the detectives and the police come on the scene, they want to talk to eyewitnesses. You know, people who were there, people who were inside the bank, people who were who were the actual people who were victims of the robbery. You know, you don't want to talk to, um, you know, Uncle Tim that was around the corner six blocks away, <laughs> you know, and he's going to talk about what he heard instead of somebody actually being there. So you basically, you want to get closest to the source as you can. So that's why you have these, this hierarchy of primary, secondary, and tertiary um, sources. So that's the whole, that's the whole thing. But uh, Antoine, you said you had a comment or a question. Yeah, I'll start off with uh, my comment. Then I'll go into my, uh, my question. But my uh, basic comment, man, I feel like you must've been trolling me this week or something because uh, this concept or this information as it relates to um, these three uh, concepts as far as primary, secondary, and uh, attestation is very necessary. Uh, I was recently in a uh, conversation uh, over uh, Facebook, and what uh, what it got into or what the conversation dealt with was to, um, going back and, I guess, determining the uh, responsibilities and the roles of the Netarus. Mm -hmm. And so everyone had, you know, <clears throat> given their opinion or what they have read or maybe Wikipedia or what have you. And so my take on it was um, 
can you can you find um, this behavior in in a in literature as far as a myth or uh, maybe um, in the Book of the Dead, Param Haru, or what have you? Can you find this uh, de this Nataru or deity doing this behavior that displays that they are um, uh, passionate or that they are a healer? You know, or what have you? I'm trying to be general because I know that this uh, this concept applies to very a uh, variety of areas. So um, that was one where area where I felt like going to the primary says as opposed to saying, oh. Uh, such and such said that this Nataru represents or, you know, actually having some examples that show me why we came up with this theory or this belief about this uh, Nataru. Right, right. So that was, you know. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm not going to say, so that was, I'm like, man, you must have been, you must have been in that chat or you must have saw me or something because that kind of dealt with the direction I was trying to go. Well, now. Because they start. It, 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 it happens on, on social media. I, I witness it all the time. You know, I, I witness it all the time. I, I've been in, I engaged it in a while. Matter of fact, there's a brother um, named Daniel uh, some weeks ago back or maybe a month or so ago when we were doing one of our hangouts like now. And he had mentioned something that, that um, got me very, very interested. He mentioned the fact that there is a um, an obelisk or Tekken that existed that exists that has hieroglyph hieroglyphs on it glyphs on it that dates to 5000 bc and so that's that's be, would be very very um interesting to me i'm like i you know i want to see it like asap like yesterday because the reason why that's that would be important to me and to and to anybody is because the hieroglyphic writing system that we know as seshmetu nature it's not un attested and there's that word again attestation attested it's only attested going back to 3320 bce so if this brother is saying that he has information about an obelisk that has that the writing system on it that dates back to 5000 bc that would be a huge fine that would be a huge fine in the entire academic uh you know academy scholarship so I had asked him, since he mentioned, I said, well, you know, show me, give me some primaries on that. Give me some primary sources on that, you know, facsimile, a picture. Um, where can I find it? Where is it stored? Who, who discovered it? You know, uh, how was it dated? And so on and so forth. And, and you know, uh, long story short, uh, the brother didn't provide any of that. You know, he provided tertiary, uh, secondary and tertiary sources of, 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 and and that and I and I say that loosely because it wasn't really talking about um an obelisk that existed in, in that time frame at all. You know, so um so that was my well that was a recent example of me being involved with with um something like that. Um so yeah, I, I see it all the time. So yeah, so I I don't it's I'm not surprised that you that you saw it, you know, what you just described as well. Um, but we find that a lot, and that's why we um, that's why we chose to have this discussion now. So yeah, people they'll um, uh, jump out and make these claims based on something that they've heard from somewhere else, and uh, they won't be able to uh, provide the actual primary that supports the claim. Which is, you know, it's a teaching moment for all of us because we can all take the time. That's the thing about it; it's, it's going to require you to research before you open your mouth, and so we can all take the time to go back if someone makes a claim and. You know, there's lots of people say it's on the onus or the onus is on the person that made the claim. Well, you made the claim, but I'm so interested in the topic that I'm going to start researching it myself as well. Uh, another claim that was made was trying to trying to date the ages of the Neturus or the which one came first uh, was the, the, the topic. And um, so my basic uh, premise was that based on the literature or based on, once again, mythology or what we can actually uh, pull up and read uh, based on the sesh, at what point in time, or what dynasty, or what um, uh, what kingdom or was this Neturu's name first mentioned? You know, where in the text can we pull it up? Because if I see this person's uh, name mentioned prior to this uh, person's name, then I, they that might be able to give us some accuracy on the date. Then again, we also know that some of the literature or some information was recopied in the Middle Kingdom or you know further down throughout the dynasty so that's something also to consider mm -hmm. well um, now 
That, now, that's the thing. Now, I, I've seen a couple of conversations um, in the past about the different, the various different Neturu and, you know, trying to date them or trying to put one before the other. Okay, now some of them you can do that with without a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but when you start talking about, because I, what I see it, because remember, you know, Africa, ancient Africa was an oral, um, we're talking about oral societies. So when you try to date uh, deities, you know, like what is the criteria of, of, of the dating? You know, because you got to, and, and then people have to understand what are deities? What are deities? Because before deities become deities, they are regular, I don't want to even say regular, but they're, they're concepts and ideas in the minds of the people themselves anyway, before it becomes deified. So like, I'm going to give you an example. Um, let's say uh, hygiene. Let's say the normal hygiene that everybody is accustomed to or should be accustomed to, you know, um, taking a shower, brushing your teeth, washing your face, cleaning, you know, washing your hands, you know, everything that goes on, up under hygiene. If we, if we as a society want to stress that importance uh, beyond the normalcy, then we would deify and we would call it hygiene and we would, we would deify hygiene make hygiene a god and and you know we would we in order to make it a a a mnemonic device to pass down through generations or whatever we may create a narrative around it and it'll be called a myth later on but it'll be a narrative where we will um, probably anthropomorphize uh hygiene make it a, into a human with a toothbrush head or something like that you know so people have to understand that that a lot of the deities are, um, you know, store, storages, mnemonic devices, storage containers for scientific data and concepts and ideas, mostly dealing with natural phenomenon, whether it's on a cosmic level, social level, or personal level. So to try to date that, it will, will be hard. So when people say that, they're really just talking about the the formal naming of that like let's say Ra or Wasir Osiris Heru um Het Heru or Set they're trying to date it and say okay well you know Oset is is uh young or you know Oset is older in South Africa or well I, I see it a lot with Nubia because a lot of people say Kush and Nubia is the mother and grandmother of of Egypt, therefore all these deities come from there and this and that. But you know, it's it's um I don't I, I don't see that being um having a lot of value in in trying to do that unless you want to break down what the meaning of these deities' names and that should be done first. A lot of people want to talk about chronology of which deities first, but why don't people need to look into what does it mean? What does the name Osiris mean? You know what I'm saying? What does the name Enpu mean? What does the name Oset actually mean? What does, um, you know, I mean, you can call off any deity. What, the, <laughs> what do they actually mean? And in what language? And then you can trace it out linguistically because we, we have to have science, scientific methods in order to do that. But anyway, that's, that's um, you know, my take on that. Yeah. Um, can, um, it may sound crazy. Um, can you give me an example of a third, fourth, and uh, fifth uh, primary? A third, fourth. Oh, yeah. yeah, that yeah. kind of goes like, uh, well, my question, what I was going to do, I was going to name off um, three different references, and I was going to see if you could tell me, based on the reference that I named, if it's a primary, secondary, or attestation. Okay, go ahead. But it's kind of like kind of like Kofi's question. Um, so I'll start. The first the first one is um, well, you showed it, you showed the um, the pyramid text. So that, that's the primary. Let's say I have a um, five reference Manetho or Herodotus. What type of what type of uh, source is that? That would be at best uh, secondary. Now it depends because if 
well, it depends on what he's what he's writing about. So if you if you reference Manito, and Manito is talking about what Manito is doing, and everything, then in that context, it could be primary because he's 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 explaining what he's doing himself. He's what he's involved in. But if Manito himself is talking about something that's historic to him, and everything, then it becomes um, secondary. Yeah. So what about Herodotus? He mentioned Herodotus. Would Herodotus be a third, uh, third, uh, third, uh, a third source? I mean, a sec. I'm mean, yeah, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, I guess if I'm saying it right. Well, like I said, it just depends on the context because the distinction between primary and secondary sources is really hinged on the context of of what you're actually um, discussing. So, so like, for example, um, um, somebody like, for example, a, a, um, let's see, what would be good? Like somebody giving commentary about something and you are referencing the commentary, then you are referencing a secondary source. So I'm thinking like, um, would this be a, um, secondary or maybe even a third source if that's uh, possible but um i'm reading uh, a sarge book and he's talking about the trees but in his book he references a story uh, of a um grandfather uh talking to his uh, grandchild about the tree and uh discipline him as he teaches him <clears throat> so if i <clears throat> so excuse me sorry about that so if i reference um the story that he shared in his book is that am I now? I, now I went through two different or three different levels of a reference. Okay, yeah. See, now you, you're talking about literary references, like citations and stuff like that. So, if you, as an author, you are citing someone's work who is citing someone else, then then that would be um, different. See, that's that would be a that that they would you know they would call that. Um, that's a little different. I mean, it's, it's similar, but that's different than what you were talking about. If, if I understand what you said, you know, because if, you know, that's like cite, citing sources. So if you're citing um, as a writer, as an author, you know, you're citing a source. So, so let's say you write a book and you, and I quote you from your book, I quote your book, I'm citing a source. So, so I'm using you as a primary, like I'm, I'm citing you directly. But if you in your book, you cite Dr. Uh, Theophile Obinga, and then I'm citing you cite Obinga, then, you know, you see the layers there. So that kind of sounds like what you're talking about. Right. What is that? What is that considered? What is that called? Is that secondary or? Oh, definitely. Yes, that, that would definitely not, not be uh, primary. If I'm, if I'm quoting you, quoting, um, citing someone else, so I'm quoting your commentary about something that you are citing and commenting on then that would be secondary all right i have one more for you mm -hmm. um i'm watching this uh, guy posted video in the video the guy is making reference to a the letter b uh the, and he says that the b really means stability because it's a man's leg or what have you and he's standing on the leg and so now i'm like man where'd you get this information from and he tells me this has been passed down through oral tradition so what's our uh, reference or our take on things that are said to be uh, passed down through oral tradition? If it's true or if it's not true, that's their reference. Okay, say that again because because I because I, there, there's a difference. But just say just give that example again. You said say that again. A guy a guy is telling me about the letter B, mm -hmm. and he talked about um, the sound is really a a BK type sound as opposed to just a ba or a B sound. And he states that uh, more importantly, it stands for uh, stability based on the fact that it's a foot. So he's actually making it uh, ideogramming, making it, giving meaning to it, saying that since it's a leg with a foot, it shows, it represents stability. And so I'm kind of like, I, I asked him, you know, can you reference this or where are you getting this information from? And he says it's been passed down through oral tradition. Well, that's not a primary source because if it's passed down, then who, then see, remember a primary source is 
we're talking about because if you're talking about something that is stated, recorded, documented, or artifacts and items, tangible items themselves, they are the direct result of whatever whatever time frame that you're dealing with, that you're talking about or, or studying. So if someone is saying that it's been passed down through generations, how many generations? Just the fact that they say generations, then it's secondary. You see what I'm saying? Because I can't, I can't talk about, we're in 2016, I can't talk about something in 1816 and say it's primary at all. There's, there's no way of, of doing that at all unless I find something from that era of time, something tangible, something recorded, documented, whatever, um, from that time frame. Or me, myself, that I bore witness to or was involved with events during that time. But I didn't live a thousand years, therefore nothing I can I can experience will ever be uh, primary in that regards. So that would be secondary. So we had we had to be clear about that. Primary is dealing with direct, like direct within your reach of your lifetime, or an actual tangible object or event in in your in your space of lifetime for it to be primary um, in terms of you yourself. Everything else will be secondary because that's when you get into um, an interpretation, an analysis of something, commentary about something, you know, that you yourself wasn't involved with directly or held or created or witnessed or or what have you, you know. So so remember, because I, I don't have to slide up anymore, but if I lived now, like let's say let's say uh, 9-11, the, uh, the Twin Towers coming down. Um, I lived during the, the era of time. Now we could talk about it hindsight and I can write about it. It would be more of a primary source because, because especially if I was there, you know, let's say I, I was one of the um, firemen re rescue workers that was there. And then 2016, I want to write a book about it. That would be a primary source. Because I'm, I, I was involved, even though it's hindsight uh, that I'm speaking about it, but I was involved, it was direct and so on and so forth. It wouldn't be um, secondary in that sense. And like I said, these definitions are not 100% uh, um, black and white. That's why on the slide I, I showed that it, it is a little bit blurry and it depends on the context. So when you talked about the um, the, the letter B and, and the guy saying that, that's a diff that's you got to take that into consideration, the context. So when he says pass through the generations, that's not primary. Mm -mm. All right, we got and, your box. and it's and 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 that's why I, I sorry about that cut you off. Um, that's why I threw in there the word attested too, because because word of mouth. I mean, we know this. We 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 played the game in elementary school where all the children line up, and then on on one end of the line, a teacher will whisper a short story in their ear, and then the, and then every child has to pass. The story on to the next child until it gets to the end and then the child at the end uh recites the story that they received and it'd be totally different than what the teacher gave the first child so word of mouth and things we know through through um experimentation and studies that it can be become distorted so th this is where and why science uh spends a, um, a large amount of time trying to get to the primary source and trying to get to attested things as opposed to secondary, tertiary, and, and everything else. You know what I mean? So that's, that's why. So we have to keep all, all that in mind. Okay, we got your Bible, right? And we say that uh, some of the authors wrote or produced the material 300 years after yep uh, quote unquote you know after uh the uh mythical uh, individual what have you right mm -hmm. and so based on that since it was written 300 years later and they were not there at that point in time to actually witness these events mm -hmm. the bible would be considered a secondary Oh, it definitely wouldn't be eyewitness accounts, and that's and that's an argument that's that's always held among um, you know people of the Abrahamic faith versus those who are not. When they want to question it, they're like like for example, the disciples of Jesus and the book, first four books, so-called gospels, 
of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, were they eyewitnesses to the things? Like, for example, how how do they have the um, the hanging of Jesus, it, you know, in their gospels if they weren't there? You know what I'm saying? If they weren't there to witness it, Jesus didn't write it. So how do they know what happened? You know, those, those are like just kind of logical um, things to ask. But no, that wouldn't be uh, considered a, um, primary either. They're not eyewitnesses to the events. But see, now we can't confuse like in, that's what I said, in a historical setting, because, you know, the classification of sources um what the importance of classification of sources when we say primary, secondary, tertiary, that comes out of the study of history, uh, uh, historiography. That's where it starts. And then other, other academic disciplines start to use that terminology as well, but, but they use it slightly different. So when we're talking about history, you know, you have those definitions and those are the definitions that I read, you know, um, on the on the slide that I showed, but like for example, let me just read this. Let me just read this. This is from um. This is from. Let's see. What is the person's name? Give me one second. Uh, this is from um an author Helge Craig, and I'm probably pronouncing the name wrong. Uh, 1989, which is an introduction. Introduction to the histo Historiography of Science. Okay, it says many sources can be considered either primary or secondary depending on the context in which they're used. Moreover, the distinction between primary and secondary sources is subjective and contextual so that precise definitions are difficult to make. For example, if a historical text discusses old documents to derive a new historical conclusion, it is considered to be a primary source for the new conclusion, but a secondary source of the information found in the old documents. So you, so you see the difference? And, and, and to go on, uh, uh, other examples in which a source can be both primary and secondary include an obituary, um, or a survey of several volumes of a journal counting the frequency of articles on a certain, certain topic. So you are you are is that clear? Hopefully I cleared up a little bit more. To you, to you. To you. All right. So yeah, yeah. It, it it gets kinda it gets kinda tricky, but but the thing is, and, and this is why, you know, on on in these discussions on social media where you see, you know, the the problems a little bit. So that's why I wanted to bring it up for discussion, because really in our discussions with history. It is kind of straightforward. It's it, primary source is direct. Just think direct. Secondary is a layer removed. Tertiary is a layer even removed from that. So either you are directly dealing with um, the information produced in the time frame that you're talking about. And this is why I threw in the word attestation as well, because you're dealing with actual objects that have survived, you know, to this very day. This is why it's important. Like I always say, that the session metal nature writing system or the hieroglyphic writing system is attested to 3320 BCE. Now the writing system may very well be older than that, but that's as far back as we can go for attestation. That, that means we have tangible objects that we can prove and show that is the best form of evidence is, is the actual objects themselves, not word of mouth, not passed down through the generations and stuff like that, although that that is evidence as well, but you can't beat having the object versus just not having the object and talking about it. You know, so so that's what I said. Science wants to work with the best. You know, it wants to do the best to eliminate error. So that's why I also included the word attestation um, um, as well. You know, so in our discussions, you know, we want to go with primary, but we don't we don't always have primary and ancient Africa was a was oral. So we do have to rely on oral 
um, traditions and oral information, oral data that's passed down. But fortunate, and this is this is where Kemet comes becomes important. And a lot of people want to um, create this dichotomy between Kemet and Nubia, or Kemet and Kush, or Kemet and um, what's what's the other one? Um, what they say, Kemet, Nubia, Kush. You know, a lot of people want to do that, but Kemet has the most literature, most documentation, and and when you're an oral society a group of people start to materialize and crystallize what was once oral into a documented form then we have something tangible to verify and check it don't so it only makes sense for us to use it you know what i'm saying so this is why we focus on kemet and the documentation you know because one thing that if things are passed down passed down through a, a through a continuum like that it shouldn't contradict i i shouldn't find 20 uh papyri that says one thing and then somebody tells me some oral tradition from the same people says something different you know what i'm saying we we we, we shouldn't have that and if we do at least we got we have something to examine and and scrutinize you know so that's the that's the benefit of why Kemet is focused on a lot when it comes to um, Nile Valley history, um, that whole area, that whole region, from from Uganda, Kenya on up, Sudan, Ethiopia, um, Egypt today, and and all of that, you know. So that's what we have to um, that's what we have to deal with. Because I always, I always ask people, because a lot of people will, will um, almost on a complaining uh, vibe of why do you talk about chemists so much and how come nobody talks about Kush and Nubia? You know, and then I always talk about, you know, why we shouldn't use the word Nubia. But then when we get down to it, I'm like, well, produce a lot of the um, literature from, from um, these other places. Just produce it and we'll talk about it. Just produce it. I said it's just, it's just a plethora of. Uh, I mean, Kemet is the most documented ancient um, civilization culture that there is. You still find the stuff, you know. So a lot of people say, you know, well, there's there's more pyramids in um, Sudan than there are in in Kemet, you know, and they'll show the picture, and like, okay, that's great. But see, people will say it, not not just to say it and say, "Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of them in there." They'll say it as in, as if it's better, or whatever. And and, and I, I don't I don't know that we should do that. I don't know that we should do that. Why create a competition out of it? Let's just use them both as a resource and and uh, learn from it. You know, so. Um, yes, I was going to ask if you could just um, clarify one more time. Um, if we have the transcriptions of, um, you know, from, from the original uh, primaries, would that be a primary, a reproduction of a primary, or would that would be considered a um, secondary source? That's a secondary. All right. Like the example I gave with the Pappers, uh, Prissy, it, it would be a transcription of a primary, but the transcription itself will be secondary because because somebody had to come after the fact and transcribe it. And now you're relying on the accuracy of that transcription, then looking directly at the primary. So that would that would set that apart from each other. So, you know, so I, I mean, I guess at the at the at the bottom of it all is that we our interest should be in the um elimination of error at, at at all possible um causes you know that's the goal to eliminate error so either you have a primary source which is the papyrus right there in front of you and then if you go to transcribe it and 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 transcribe it on another medium let's say you're looking at the uh, and this is what egyptologists have done you know, they will sit at a temple and they will set up 
uh, their tripod and their paper and everything like that. And they would sit there for days upon days, weeks, and, and stay there and um, redraw what you see on the wall. And that's what you see in uh, some of these books, these transcribing of what is on the wall. So the wall itself is the primary. The, the scholar who is transcribing it can potentially make errors. He may skip glyphs. He may draw them wrong or whatever the case is. Not to say that it is, but I'm saying the potential is there. So as a scientist, we want to, we want to eliminate error. So we would prefer to deal directly with the wall. Um, but if we can't, we'll, we'll deal with the scholar's reproduction of it. Um, but knowing that there's, a, there's room for error. You know, so, you know, at the, end of, at the end of the day, you know, the whole point is to try to eliminate error as much as possible. And so this is why primaries always ask. When people make claims, you're like, well, do you have a primary source for that? What would it be if um, um, somebody was seven years old, they saw an uh, alien? That would be a secondary source? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Now what would it be if when somebody was seven years old, they saw an alien, an alien came and spoke to him? Would that be a um, primary? No, see, that's what I mean. Like earlier, what I was saying, like we're, we're, we're mixing up sources of, of uh, documentation and, and historical artifacts and things like that for, for a new context of eyewitness, like witnessing, you know, and, and stuff like that. Because... You know, so that's a different context. So if a seven-year-old claims to have seen an alien, that same seven-year-old mo most likely will be the same child that will say they saw the boogeyman in the closet or something like that. So the, the statement, the truthfulness, see, don't confuse the truthfulness of a statement based, based on the source. So it's a direct source if you heard from the child yourself and the child themselves said, hey, I saw an alien, that is a direct source. That is a primary source for that statement and that claim. But the truthfulness of it is a completely different topic, completely different, completely different ways of discerning the truthfulness of it. So, so we, we can't confuse the classification of a source versus its truthfulness of it. Because even, like, I'm just going to give an extreme example. We could be standing right in Egypt looking at a wall um, an ancient wall that, that wasn't modified by nothing modern. It was done by the ancient Egyptians themselves, and we're standing right there. Let's say we are, we're at Edfu, and we're at the corner, and we're looking at these glyphs right there on the wall. That is a primary source. But whatever those glyphs are saying and everything like that, the truthfulness of it could be completely wrong. Th th those glyphs can say that the, um, the earth is flat, the the uh, sun goes around the earth and all that kind of stuff let's just say that let's just say the glyphs read that let's just say that that was the message in in the glyphs the message and the claim is wrong itself but it's still a primary source so so i don't want to confuse maybe i should have said that at first as well uh we, we can't confuse source classification for the accuracy of whatever whatever we're dealing with okay they're, they're, um, I they're different things. Um, was it that's why we? Um, I think um, you were talking about um, primary so uh, or primary sources and attestation in this in this sense that would be like if it it it, it is attested, um, you know, validating that something it, it is a fact and it's true. Right. So, right. But you know, I just I just want to make it clear. Maybe I should have. So that's that's um that's um my apologies for that but we have to make a distinction between source classification and accuracy of of claims or you know statements claims and 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 the information yeah i think that is good because um most people will actually um say uh you know what was then judy was um, was asking about some people will be like well they do have a primary source you know so and so said so and you'd be like that's what's needed so i guess it is good that you know it has to be clarify that it's not just about having a primary source in that sense because that could also be especially when you're dealing with witnesses or you know and, and stuff like that 
doesn't mean that you know it is truth or what you know just because right. you have a primary source yes and that's a good thing and like i said i should i should have um, made that clear from the start that a primary source does not mean true they 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 don't necessarily equate to one another all right so we need to make that clear um Primary, when we say primary and we say secondary and we say tertiary, we're saying one, two, and three, and we're, we're talking about a hierarchy of source, and these are classification of sources. The truthfulness of whatever the issue is, is, is a different animal, is a, is a, is a different thing, okay? Because you can have a primary source, but it could be 100% wrong in, in whatever, it, whatever it does to claim or whatever the case is. So I, I should have made that clear um, from the start. And, I, and, um, and that's what we have to, because see what happens is, see that, that goes over into a logical fallacy. Um, probably the closest one that fits is um, 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 arguing, arguing from authority. And that's, that's a logical fallacy where you say, basically it goes like, um, well, Dr. So-and-so said it, so it must be true. And that's a, that's a logical fallacy because I don't care what and who you are, just because you say it does not automatically make anything true. To you, it's appealing to authority. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Appealing to authority. Exactly. That's, that's a, um, the closest logical fallacy to that, and that's what people do as well. Like, okay, well, I got a primary source, therefore, it's true. No, that's appealing to authority. Same concept. So we have to be careful. So, yeah, I should have made that clear at first. Um, I'm looking at the chat real quick. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. because I, I do see a couple of uh, questions here. Uh, Black history. Can't a tertiary source be a collection of primary sources? Um, yeah, if you read, if you saw the definition that I put, it's usually a. Um, they say it's, it's a distillation, like I like how I put it was um, a collection, like a data collection of things. Um, Like for example, an encyclopedia would be tertiary, you know, where you know a whole bunch of different articles, collect a collection of articles, um, put in put in uh, alphabetical order based on the topic or alphabetical order based on the original author, um, such as journals and things like that, you know, those would be considered tertiary. Um, I'm just going down the list. So it says, why shouldn't we use the word Nubia? Um, the reason why is because in um, Egyptological literature, all they did was they substituted the word Negro for Nubia. And that would be a gross uh, misrepresentation of, of the facts, of the data. Because south of Egypt, you had several different um, communities. And they were named, and we know the names of them because they're they're within the the uh, the literature itself. You know, so you have Ta Nehesi, or Nehesi. You have uh, Yam. You have Wawet. Um, these are just three. I'm naming off the top of my head. You have several different um, communities that were that was below the borders of Kemet at the time, and everyone lumps them all together and call them Nubia, but that can get very confusing. But the, I'm just telling you, the reason why they did that was because all they did was say that below Egypt lived the Negroes. And then um, when the word Negro became politically incorrect to use, they switched it to Nubia. And a lot of people don't realize that. So when they say Nubia, they're, you know, it's not a good representation. And then it gets confusing because Nubia as a, as a toponym, as a place, is actually within Kemet. You have Ombos and Kom Ombo. Both of those places was known as um, places of gold, and that's where you get the word noob from, gold. And these were gold places where they mined gold from, and they're within the borders of Kemet. So if you want to talk about south of Kemet, how are you going to talk about names that's within Kemet? So it gets very, very confusing really quick, really quick. A lot of people don't realize it. 
So, so those are some of the reasons why we shouldn't use the word Nubia. We should use the words that 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 um are attested. <laughs> if we want to talk about a people, let's talk about Tanahisi. Let's talk about uh, you got Taseti, Tanahisi, you got Wawet, you got Yam. Um, I can't recall uh, the others off the top of my head, but remember the nine bows, the so-called nine bows. There were nine communities that were prevalent. So they're nine and they're more than nine, but they're nine prevalent, and they were referred to as the nine bows that were below the southern border of Kemet, that first cataract. Uh, what is different between a transcription and a picture? Well, a transcription is just that. It's a script that's transferred. So it's basically you are transcribing. You are um, like me talking right now. If, um, if you wanted to record what I'm saying in written format, in a script format, that would be considered transcribing. You would be transcribing what I'm saying. And I, I, I would call what I'm doing dictation or dictating. I'm dictating to you and you are transcribing what I'm dictating. A picture is, is, is just that. A picture is an image. It's a visual image. All right, so that's the, that's the difference between that. And, uh, but like I said, trans, transcription, don't confuse. Transcription is not always uh, from, from vocal or audible to, to visual or written. It's also from written to written. It's different from transliterations because, you know, you're basically mapping out one script from a source or a source uh, writing system to the script of a target writing system. That's, that's transliteration. That's different. Transcription would be if I'm going to copy uh, something from one medium uh, to another. Like if I'm looking at the wall, then I can transcribe it. If I'm listening to you talk, I can transcribe it. So those are the uh, difference, differences there. Um, I'm scrolling down to see if I miss anything. And I guess not. So anybody on the panel have any, any more, um, anything else? I hope what I'm saying is clear because, you know, like I said, uh, I should have made that clear from the get-go as far as the um, primary, don't confuse primary source with accuracy. They're, they're, not, all, they're not always mutually uh, one and the same, although they can be. You know. Now everything is clear. It makes sense. All right, well, uh, I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss anything in the chat. You know, and these are one of those topics that, uh, you know, <laughs> it's one of those, well, I guess it should be straightforward, but no, it's not. It's, 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 it's not. It's, it's, it can get confusing real fast um, about that. I've, I've seen it happen. Yes, and uh, I guess at, at some point also it might be good to go over. I know it's dealing with um, this kind of stuff that we do with, uh, with ancient um, Egypt, uh, researching and, and actually finding prime, you know, finding primary sources. You know, I know it's, uh, it can get a little bit, you know, exhausting and it's difficult most of the time. And I, I guess that's why most people would, you know, kind of toss it to the side and, and work with the secondary sources instead when referencing and, and, and stuff like that. So maybe that would be a good one to go over at some point, you know, how to see and find, you know, primary sources and also ref how to reference them as well and all of that. Okay. Yeah. And also that um, it's because people, it, it's, it's not like elevated or emphasized enough for us to deal with primary sources that, or even the confusion of it, that people will say some other things such as um, the, rely, the reliance on non-African sources for African phenomena. So like, for example, people are under the assumption that everybody who deals with Kemet is relying on European Egyptology. 
because they have all of the information you know like we're getting everything from europeans therefore what we're getting is european and that's really silly because um like i said earlier if i want to deal with the papri papyrus of ani the book of the dead of ani or the uh, paretim heru of ani then we have to first establish and in terms of african versus european was it an african that wrote the the papyrus or was it a european and then once we establish that it was an african that wrote it it doesn't matter who is housing it or who owns it right now in 2016 well, if I walk up into the British Museum and I can see it displayed there, which is a European country, Britain, that doesn't change the content of or the authorship of the actual artifact or, you know, the item. But people will confuse that and say, hey, you got that from Europeans. Like, no, you know, they hold it, but I'm, I'm looking at it. And, and it, you know, <laughs> I'm dealing with the actual information. I'm dealing with the primary itself. So that's, you know, so I think if more and more people understand the concepts of, of, of source classification and know that source classification is different than accuracy of different things, but as long as people can understand that and we start moving towards um, the preference of dealing with primary sources, then people won't make those silly uh, statements as well, like, you know, um, we deal simply with uh, European sources for African phenomena, and that's just not true, you know. But I see, I see Bla uh, Black History, he clarified his question. He said, my question wasn't clear, so he's asking, what's the difference between a picture and transcription, transcription as it relates to sourcing? Okay, now, the difference, if I understand your question correctly now, is that a a picture is a re, is a is a one for one reproduction of an object without without error unless there's um visible artifacts in the film that you took a picture on like if you're doing a kodak or olden days or if it's digital nowadays it's pretty much one for one okay versus transcription if if a if a, a man or woman sat there and redrew the wall versus somebody taking a picture of it the picture is more reliable because of of the actual technology of the camera and everything like that it can actually take a um a true a true to to life uh duplication of it whereas a human being man or woman will sit there and redraw it that that leaves more room for error so that will be the difference or one of the differences between the two um, in terms of sourcing. Yeah, actually, uh, <clears throat> the picture of it would be uh, considered a, a facsimile, which is a, a exact copy of it. So, Yeah, and that would be considered, uh, that would equate to being a primary. And like I said, there's no black and white cut and dry uh, one one uh, definition fits all to primary and secondary. So we can't box it in like that. It's just the 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 that's why I say at the end of the day, the bottom line is that you the goal is to eliminate error. So if you had a choice between getting a picture of an Egyptian temple wall versus a a human being's drawing of that same wall which would you choose that's what it really comes down to and you would choose the picture over the human being because the human human can can um misdraw a glyph or omit a glyph but the picture the way the technology is today is everything it would be um an exact image of it only thing in the picture you have to worry about is lighting or shadows or something like that but you don't have to worry about the uh the possibility of human error so the choice you know is the preference um la marie it says uh authenticity is in question i guess when it comes to where the artifacts are located 
Uh, yeah, well, there's a whole authentication process. Yeah, so that's a that's a process within itself because even even in different academic circles, they have authentic authentic authentication processes that are not universal for all disciplines, but a lot of disciplines do have them. Like for example, in in um, the American court system in the, in the judicial system, they have a way of authenticating documents. You know, authenticating your birth certificate, authenticating your identification, and things like that. Um, and in archaeology and whatnot, and things, they have ways to authenticate. Like, um, and you'll see it a lot um, commercially in movies when it comes to paintings. You know, they'll say, uh, "Well, how do you know this this Picasso or um, Da Vinci's?" masterpiece is actually authentic you know is it fake is it real is it authentic is it a reproduction is it a knockoff you know they have ways to um to authenticate things so that would have to be studied and and uh, learned so people will be in the know about that uh, another thing on social media you got to be aware of <clears throat> is when they like um they have pictures of indians to say they're Native American, and it'll be from a different time period, or it might be a, a tribe in Africa, and they might misrepresent it. So you gotta be careful with that too. I yeah. ran into that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true too. Context, context is everything. Context is everything, you know. And you know what's interesting, and this is probably be the last thing I'll say. Um, matter of fact, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a video. Well, there's a video with him in it, and I forgot the title of the video, but it's a video where he's talking about um, UFOs. He's talking about aliens, and he's talking about UFOs. And he's talking about the, um, the strength of eyewitness testimony. He's talking about the, the strength of testimony. And he's and he's and he's and he's given an example. He he gives an example of in science what people do in science versus what people do in in just day to day everyday living the late the lay <clears throat> population. And he was saying in science, eyewitness testimony like if we if we were to have a scale from zero to ten, uh, zero being the worst and ten being the best, he he said that eyewitness testimony would be at the bottom of the list within a science within uh, scientific fields but in and he and he was he made a point to say that which is terrible because he said in the court system eyewitness testimony is on the top of the list and so after he said that he explained why he said that eyewitness testimony our human senses see touch taste hear smell are very frail they're 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 easily manipulated he said, "So, so they're the they're the worst things that we could rely on when it comes to reality and truth, which sounds kind of odd, but it makes sense." And he said, and he was basically saying, "I'm paraphrasing, of course," he was basically saying, "This is why in science we develop instrumentations and technologies and things to extend the human senses to make them more um, less uh, prone to error." You know what I mean? So, and then he gave the example of the little boy, the uh, the 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 classroom, where you um, tell a story. You know, like I like I said, you tell a story to one one child, and by the time it goes to fifty children, the story completely changed. But yet they're they're directly hearing it from ear to ear, all within the same day, or however long it takes to tell a story. They they they're doing it in that short span of time, and you can see that the story changes. So how do we how do we eliminate that? How do we eliminate error and stuff? So that's that's where scientific instrumentation comes into play, where you have math. Math is a big, 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 big part of um, a lot of different scientific fields. You know, so um, the you know it it's you have to use a more objective uh, language than a subjective language when you're dealing with science. So that was some of the things that he was point he was pointing out, and so. Um, and we have to keep all that stuff in mind, you know, eyewitness testimony um, of all these different things. So that's when you ask me, you know, if a seven-year-old says, you know, they saw an alien, 
nah, in science that won't work. Now I, I don't remember the, the name of the video, but yeah, just just uh matter of fact on YouTube in the search bar, just type in uh DeGrasse Tyson or Neil DeGrasse Tyson and UFO. Just type in those words like that or whatever, and it should come up. And you'll see it. it'd be real interesting. He makes an excellent point about that. But um well that's all I have for this topic, you know, for tonight. You know, I just want to kind of bring it up and discuss it a little bit. Uh, because it is it is a um, blurred topic and and you know we can definitely understand how it it, it can get confusing you know so um, anybody else have any uh, comments or questions on the panel um, yeah I just wanted to add that that is um it, it's really good um, and obviously uh, what we see a lot nowadays is you know uh, especially, say, you know, since we have a YouTube and all of that, and we have a lot of teachers on YouTube, uh, it's a lot of teachings going on, and no referencing, no primary sources, no, a lot of just pretty much no uh, authentic or attested, um, you know, sources and, and all of that. So, so I, you know, I think it's really good that we touch on that, and you know, the more people um, understand this, the more the people watching or learning can um, dissect what kind of information they're getting you know it's always good to 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 ask for these kind of sources you know it, it just kind of it, it strengthens every point that is made yeah definitely and that's what it's all about it's about accuracy now remember science um this is another thing that we didn't we didn't bring this up but you know might as well mention it and close out with this um uh, burden of burden of proof. That's a that's a whole nother topic as well. Burden of proof, and that that gets a little confusing uh, in social media discussions, also, because you, you know a lot of people are, are making claims, and then they're they'll make a claim. Like for example, I'll make a claim, and then I'll ask you to prove me wrong, and that's just backwards. That's not the way it goes. You know, the burden of proof is always on the claimant. You know, the responsibility or the burden of proof rests on the shoulders of the person or people who are making the claim you have to demonstrate proof of your claim or provide the evidence that supports your claim not the other way around but we see this a lot on social media where a claim will be made and then somebody will let, will say well prove me wrong you know and and that is 180 degrees backwards you know but i bring that up because um in, in discussing you know um, primary sources and, and attestation and things like that. And we're talking about um, the frailty of human senses and stuff like that. We have to remember that this is what science is. Science is two, two things. Well, we are, a lot of people should know that the word science means to know. It comes from a word that means to know in general. And it comes out to be two things. Science itself is a body of knowledge itself so it's, it's an accumulation of knowledge but how was that knowledge obtained and that leads into the other definition of science science is the tools and methods that's used in order to allow us to know when something is known and it does that by its um, original meaning going way back in its etymological meaning which is to cut which is to slice or cut up and dissect. So science, in all of its meanings, from, from its original meaning to uh, cut, dissect, in terms of uh, the Indo-European um, root or etymological um, origin, all the way up until its use today, it has something to do with elimination, cutting something and eliminating, cutting something and eliminating, trimming, 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 trimming. So we have to remember the concept of science is always trying to trim off error. So if we look at it in terms of, um, I guess, uh, analogy would be meat. You know, you're trying to trim off the fat. So science is always trying to trim off the fat. You weigh it, uh, still some fat there, trim it off. Weigh it, uh, still some fat, fat there, trim it some more off. So science is always in, in a process of eliminating, eliminating, eliminating. You know, you don't prove things in science. You actually attempt to falsify things. And this is why this is the big difference between science and pseudoscience. Science deals with falsifiable things and pseudoscience doesn't. If it's not falsifiable, 
then it's not science. So remember that science seeks to falsify things. So you create a hypothesis, you, you observe some kind of phenomena, you have a hypothesis about it. Then you go through rigorous testing and retesting and re um, speculations and things like that. And then, um, you know, once you can reproduce whatever, then you come away with an explanation of the facts and that explanation of, of those substantiated facts becomes a theory. So science is always seeking to eliminate error. And what happens is the whole concept is based on if you eliminate error enough, all you're going to be left with is reality. That's the idea behind science. Okay, so, and it ties into this burden of proof thing where people are making these claims, but they don't go through the process of eliminating error. Okay, so I just wanted to, you know, kind of, um, in with that, but that's that's what science is about, and it ties into what we're dealing with. All right. So, if nobody else has anything else to say, you know, I want to thank everybody for um, for tuning in, and I will pass the mic over to uh, Sonia Tonica for any closing words. All right, um, Dua for the information and uh do well for those who been watching and those who are going to be watching later on and um i would just like to say that um if you'd like um if you'd like to get more into this kind of discussions you can join our group page on facebook which is um under the name seshuma ani and um if you'd like to learn the language or get more information on it as well um um, you can um, go to the website www.merunetra.com which is mdw-ntr.com and um, we have also some videos on our archive um, if you haven't watched those you can go ahead and uh, do that and um, uh, if there's something that you feel you'd like to share with others also you know feel free to share the videos that we have on the archive um, with others on Facebook or you know, other social media um, pages as well. So with that, I'd like to say um, get an affair and um, share my motive.